Well, I'm glad to I'm humbled to be here today. Uh, my name is Zach Jones, and I'm here to talk about uh, um, efforts to document historic Chilkat weavers. Um, the title is The Cycle of Chilkat Weavers, and to share information about them. Uh, before we begin, we certainly must acknowledge that we are on Aquan lands today, um, and give a special thanks to all of our many volunteers. It takes a lot of people um, to do all the work to organize the conference, to record it, to provide us with refreshments. Very grateful. And certainly I would not want this to be forgotten. I'm a person who's trying to be a learner um, and, and certainly learning, but a lot of what I've been taught and have been pointed towards in my research has uh, been, Harold Jacobs has been a major influence and a real a very kind teacher and helping me learn these things. So I certainly wouldn't want folks to think this research all just came from me. Um, the stuff that is said that's right and certainly comes from Harold and I want to acknowledge Harold and his kindness and teaching. And also before I begin, the theme of this conference is about uh, names, clan names, and I just put a few up here these are the names of different eagle and raven weavers, Chilkat weavers from history. But just to think about that, what names mean. Uh, so what am I going to do today uh, for my presentation? Really just, I just am here to share information about some of these weavers from the past. That's it. And uh, I'll begin uh, by talking about some of the eagle clan weavers and then finish with some of the, or excuse me, I'll start with Raven and then end with some of the Eagle Land Weavers. So I said I'm here to share information. Uh, what does that kind of mean? Uh, I'm just trying to, and working to document the different weavers, especially biographical information about these individuals, um, and trying to attribute some of their works seems like a fair amount of folks have kind of heard or know of a, a weaver named Jenny Clanat, um, a really great, great individual, but uh, working to talk about more people like her. Um, certainly, and try to share this information with folks, especially weavers um, and young people. And I certainly have to acknowledge that I can't mention all the weavers that have existed or are out there or are known. So please forgive me if I don't mention someone you were hoping to hear about, uh, but you can certainly talk to me after or, or, or communicate anytime. And certainly I have to acknowledge that there are things that uh, are known or, or, or unknown to me, um, or maybe sometimes I just have a, maybe a guess about. But to try to speak carefully, but certainly don't know everything. And this work is really ongoing. And, if I make a mistake or you feel I've left something out, heavens come up and grab me after or uh, um, ask a question afterward. Um, but I'm just trying to be a learner. But to start off, I'm going to talk about some raven clan weavers. Uh, in part, often it's been told that uh, Chilkat weaving kind of came from the, from Klukwan, from the Ganoctati women who began show having uh, among the clinket. And to just start off with one of these weavers, and I started off, I'm just going to kind of mention a handful of weavers and share some information and some of their works. Some people may have heard of uh, Clara Benson. Uh, she was, as often remembered, as the one who taught Jenny Clanot's mother how to weave. And of course, this was then passed on to Jenny Clanot. But Clara Benson, uh, uh, who was born in 1851 and passed away in 1935, was really a very highly skilled Chilkat weaver. This is a picture of her that you can see. She was Ganaktedi, Whale House, and a Kagwan Tanyani. Uh, she was the daughter of a woman named Kulit Kla, and her father's name was ha Hajusa. And sometime during her early life, she married a Kaguantan man named John Benson. Um, it's really a little bit unknown to me exactly who she learned to weave from. 
perhaps her mother or another Donatei auntie. Um, this is really one of those questions I'm still trying to figure out is who all these people learned from. And sometimes there is a genealogy of weaving, but still working to figure this out. But I'd say definitely she was one of the greatest weavers of her day. Um, and to show maybe some of her works, around the year 1900, uh, she wove this uh, brown bear chilcat tunic uh, that her husband uh, has been, was known to wear. And uh, she's been documented as the maker of that. You can see the front and the back here. And part of this, I think, as one tries to look and document all these weavers, you can see certain styles and certain things that show up. Sometimes uh, records that are in a museum or for objects that are in museums or materials that are still worn regularly in communities, folks know these things. But it's important to see certain styles as well. Um, she's also been attributed by the various uh, elders who spoke to Frederica de Laguna and a fellow weaver and clan sister, Mary Williams, that she was the weaver of this, uh, this uh, <laughs> this tunic here that was went to Yakutat. It was a Tequiti Tequi, Tequi clan uh, tunic. It's at Portland Museum and was one time cared for by the Hoots Hit uh, clan house leader, Sitok Jim of Yakutat. And there are a few robes by her that are known. This is one here. That you can see this is uh, still in the community and used very often, which is good. And if anything, I'd certainly like to acknowledge that all these things have a spirit. And kind of for fun, you know, trying to document some of these people, it's a little, sometimes there are individuals that there's a, a little bit of information about, some more than others, and sometimes it's a little hard to find anything about other than their works and some things. But uh, Clara was fairly well known at the time as being a really good weaver. And it, there's a really kind of an interesting experience with her. Because of her skill, it was sort of an interesting operation, but in 1929, the Alaska Territorial Department of Education hired Clara to teach Chilkat weaving at the Aklutna Indian School, which is up near Fairbanks. And they, took her and her husband up there to teach the different native students <coughs> how to weave, do, do chokat weaving. Um, and she selected four students from among the group, and she taught them how to weave, and they wove a full-sized robe. And this robe, reportedly, according to one of the students, was later exhibited at the Chicago World's Fair. I wish I could find that robe still looking for it. And if you know the robe or any robes that were exhibited in 1933 at the fair, I'd love to know that. But, uh, and she was, uh, this venture was really smiled upon and it was, she was even mentioned by name um, in the governor's annual report. And a number of these young students, these were teenage girls, wrote little letters and stories about what it was like to learn from Clara Benson. Um, and these kind of give some information about who Clara was as a person, which is kind of what I like. Um, one letter, and I'm just giving a snippet from Louise Davis here, um, she just mentioned, and this kind of gives you an understanding that Clara was not an English speaker. She was thinking only in the Clinket, in Clinket, in the Clinket world. But quote from a letter written by Louise Davis, the teacher could not speak English, so we watched closely what had to be done. Her husband spoke a little English and did the interpreting for her. So if you can imagine learning to weave across languages. Um, and there's another letter I want to read by one of these young students, this young girl. It's a little bit long, but I think it's uh, really neat. I've got a picture of it here by one of the young girls named Rose Rasmussen. And she kind of mentions what it was like to learn showcat weaving from Clara in 1929. And it says, uh, last summer, Mr. Wagner, who was a school administrator, sent Mrs. Benson from Cluckwan to teach us girls how to weave the famous Chilcat blanket. Mrs. Benson is one of the last of the Chilcat weavers. 
I, I disagree with that. There was lots more after her or more after her, but that's fine. But she arrived early in July, and we started the very next day to begin to prepare for our blanket. The first thing we had to do was boil the cedar bark for about five hours in order to get all the sticky substances out of it. After this was done, we hung the bark on a line to dry out somewhat. While we were waiting for this, we began to pick out all the coarse hair from the goat's wool, leaving only the soft, fluffy part. When the bark was not quite dry, we tore it into shreds about a quarter of an inch wide, then twisted it with the goat's wool, making a sort of rope. This all had to be done by hand and was very tiresome. Uh, after the rope was made, Mrs. Benson picked out four girls to start on the big blanket. She chose Elsie Rasmussen, Louise Davis, Madeline Wells, and myself. Each girl had to work on a certain section. Miss Benson, Benson, Mrs. Benson showed us how to measure and fix the rope on the loom. We started on the top, which was to be about two inches wide. After that was done, we began on the designs. The pattern was copied from one painted board, which was a, of a very old design. There were mostly animal faces, bears and frogs. Our blanket is six feet long and four feet wide and is woven out of black, white, yellow, and greenish blue yellow. The rug was very hard to work on. It hurt our hands, but we worked away every day until November. We enjoyed learning how to make it. It is very valuable, too. Mrs. Benson sold two blankets she had made the winter before for $200 each. There were the they were the same size as ours. We are going to hang ours up in the new girls' dormitory. So I kind of thought that was a fun little letter that gives some context about a young woman's experience who interacted with Clara and how it was not easy. These things take an enormous amount of work and skill. And next, moving on to a, another uh, Raven Weaver. This is a picture of Mary Williams. She was a Donna Tady whale house, also born in Clubwarn. And though a close relative to Clara Benson, I'm not exactly sure who William's parents were. That's something I'm trying to figure out. And I'm still trying to figure out what her Quaker name was. Um, she married a, an individual named John Williams early in life. Um, but the census records show her as being a widow for at least the last couple decades of her life. Um, and. Uh, she was, uh, certainly, although there are a few things that are unknown about her sort of personal life, um, she was clearly a very talented artist. Uh, she was a skin sewer, uh, moccasin maker, beater, basket weaver, and a whole bunch of other things, a really talented artist. Um, and this picture here comes from the historic records of the Alaska Native Arts and Crafts Cooperative Association. This was an organization um, from about the 30s to the 60s that would essentially buy art from artists and then sell it at more uh, bigger, I guess in Juneau where there's a larger market. And so it brought in a lot of art from the villages and a lot of these weavers sold works to that. But uh, this is just a picture of a record of all her sales to that. Um, and it just kind of shows a little bit more about who she was. And she especially made a lot of the beautiful beaded wall bags, a great beater. Now, some of her works, there was that picture of her weaving that blanket. Um, in regards to some of her works, although she's a couple uh, decades younger than Benson, um, there's some evidence they, they clearly interacted as weavers, both from the same clan and clan house. And Williams uh, informed Axel Rasmussen that both she and Benson um, had used the same Chilkat weaving pattern boards. And speaking of a brown bear tunic uh, pattern board, uh, she told Rasmussen, quote, uh, Mrs. Williams told Mr. Rasmussen that she herself had made three shirts from this pattern and that a Mrs. Benson had made several more. So although I don't and have not been able to find uh, the actual pieces woven by 
Mary Williams, because there were a few, um, it's known she made it at least, or so it sort of appears. Um, and on the flip side, on the other side of this board is this uh, uh, raven tunic pattern. And uh, Gunther, who, who uh, was an anthropologist who reported it, or, or used Rasmussen's notes to get this information, said that uh, Williams had told him that, quote, only two shirts were made from this, um, both by Mrs. Williams. Um, although there, it does appear that uh, Mary Williams made a couple tunics from this raven pattern where there actually are a few more than two in existence. I'm not exactly sure which one she made. I'm still working on that, but it's known that she made one or, or a couple from that pattern board. Here's another picture of her. Uh, although there are certain details about her life that are un known, I kind of want to just give a little snippet uh, of information about her. Um, in 1944, she testified or, or gave a statement to uh, Goldschmidt and Haas about Clinkett land use and Clinkett land ownership. Um, this is in the book Ha'ani, if you're familiar with it. And she talked about, and there's a big statement about her where she speaks uh, about her young life and subsistence practices, how she traveled all around the area. Um, and you can really get a sense of really the importance of Clinkett life ways, respecting clan ownership. Uh, from, from the words she gives. And I just wanted to give a little snippet just about, um, it sort of talks about her own work and, and what it was like. And this is a statement from her about gathering berries mostly. Quote, uh, the berries used used to be gathered in great quantities and used in many different ways. We might fill three or four big baskets, a bushel or more, and then go to the next place. Some of these berries we dried in the old ways. Now we put them in jars. Dry berries were pressed into cakes and stored in wooden boxes. Blueberries were preserved in hooligan oil, but now we use crocks instead of boxes. We used to put it in cans and sell it to the Angun and Huna people for about $6 for a five gallon can. Also, some of the people sold cakes of dried blueberries. Cooked cranberries with salmon eggs in into a kind of thick jam and stored in boxes. Now that's just a little snippet, and you can read more about it if you have a copy of Han and you want to get it. But uh, just a really a good person with a deep-seated knowledge. Um, I think that's an example of what a lot of these folks had, was a real deep-seated knowledge. And now the next and last raven weaver that I'm going to talk about, uh, Kakediat, um, who was, has been attributed as a Ghanak Teddy weaver. I, there are no known pictures of her, and really not much information about who she was as an individual. So this is some one really working to uh, find out about, and Harold Jacobs has, has, has identified her. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this robe here, um, the Killerwell Flotilla robe, um, a significant robe, and she has been attributed as the maker of this robe. Carol has found this out. Now, it's a little bit hard to track her, but if you look closely at this robe, and if you've looked at all the robes that really are out there, you'll notice there's some nice green here, um, some green um, in the warp, this warp fringe. And that's not on very much blankets at all, anywhere. There's only a few, four blankets that I know of in the world that have that. And Harold would, would argue, and I'd certainly agree that, uh, and here are two of the other blankets that have that green fringe. Some people have said, man, that is the longest weaver signature I've ever seen. But you can see the green here, and it's a little bit hard, I know. But uh, this one row here is at NMAI, and this one is here at the Alaska State Museum. And it's, uh, it's kind of been argued that these robes were likely by her. And one final robe, which is kind of an interesting story. This robe was collected, or ended up, unfortunately, in a museum when it came out of Simpson country. And uh, this 
Rome, when it went into the museum, a, a missionary had facilitated its removal from the community. But uh, the curator at the one museum worked to document really the history of this robe a little bit and how it came to be. And the museum, Marius Barbeau, who was a, a big anthropologist, and he referred to this a little bit as a sort of a type of brown bear robe that was collected in Cincinnati country. This is a, a museum in Canada. And I'm just going to kind of quote a little bit from his notes. Um, and he wrote that, uh, speaking of a Cincinnati clan or clan house leader, Gamek, says, uh, Gamek in a you know, ceremony adopted the Medic or Grizzly, which he already had painted on the front of his house as a headdress and pattern for the robe. He had the painting on the front of his house reproduced in painting on leather, leather and had the best Clinket woman weaver to weave it into a blanket. She took a year to weave it and was paid $150. It was made 40 years ago and it passed out of the hands of Mech into the hands of Mr. William Grove and then into the museum. So you'll see it has a <coughs> fringe as well. So. And now moving on to uh, some different eagle, eagle clan weavers. Um, to mention uh, Annie Clanny, um, really a, a person I'm really interested in. Uh, she was born in Sitka. A lot of these weavers came out of Cluck, were born in Plukwan or moved to Plukwan. And she's one that uh, was born in Sitka. Um, she was Kogwantan Eagle Nest House in Alukna Hariyari. She was the daughter of uh, Kaltsik or Sitka Jack. Um, he was a clan house leader and also was known as being a, one of the Indian policemen. And his wife, Hoot Martha Jack certainly called Wonton Eagle Nest House. Um, in her life, she married Gus Glanny. And uh, really, she was a person, a woman, who was very active in the Alaska Native Sisterhood. She was a woman, not only an artist, but she stood out in the community as a civic leader, also a community or leader in the Clinket community. And, uh, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but certainly she was one artist like a number that did sell a few pieces of art through the Alaska Native Arts and Craft, Crafts Cooperative. And I've just included a picture up here that I've been able to find and her, uh, some of the records about her work and the things she sold. A very talented artist that could work in multiple genres, a, a good beater, and sometimes the, the, they, but uh, yeah, she's a really, seems to have been a good, good artist. She's known to be the weaver of the uh, Duck Dane Ton uh, Medicine Rock uh, robe. It was made around the year 1930. That's here in Juneau. And she's one of the few weavers uh, that I try to look closely at the weaver's signature on. She often had blue and black, which was kind of an unusual signature, and all of her robes have Whereas some of the other weavers, it gets a little tricky to track weavers by signature. Um, and she was, uh, she wove a number of blankets of the pattern of the frog coming out of its stanag on a tady design. Um, and this is an example of just one. I'm not exactly sure how many she herself wove, um, but <coughs> maybe up to four. But this is an example of one here with the pattern board. Um, Here's an example of another one by her. She was also someone that weaved a lot of these smaller sized robes, sometimes for children or sometimes these um, could have had different purposes or maybe were just uh, sold. Some of these are still around, um, but uh, she was one that wove a lot of these little pieces and they're really nice and important. Now, I've kind of mentioned uh, that she was uh, one of these people, like a lot of these weavers, who was a bit of a leader and was very active in her community. And this picture here is from the 1929 um, A&B, A&S gathering in Haines, where the Clinton and Haida decided to pursue land claims at that event. And uh, she's seated uh, right here, second, uh, second over. That's her. 
And then the next picture here, I've, you know, as I've tried to find more like personal or biographical or genealogical information about some of these folks, and it gets tricky, but one place a lot of these weavers pop up is in leadership positions in ANS. And here's just an example of the Clefwan ANS camp leadership in the 1940s. And uh, Mrs. Gus Clanny there, second from the bottom, and of course all these other women here, too, were also leaders and artists as well. Some even dabbled in weaving. So next, moving on to another one, Mary Willard. Ah, lay. <coughs> she was also a Cogwanton and appears to have been born at Cluckwan. She was the daughter of Santa Ass. She married James Willard um, of the Luknahari. And according to at least Agnes <coughs> Bellinger, um, she, uh, Mary Willard, was the sec second admiral or commodore of the Yanawa Shah, the Cogwanton women who claimed the U.S. naval uniform. And this is a picture of her with a couple of her weavings. Uh, certainly a very distinct blanket here with the beaver on it. Um, and you've got a picture of her with this robe, and there are a few robes of this design, but this one has a special one with this uh, with the sockeye here. Um, and there's a picture of it in use, and you'll see it around today. It's still in use, and um, but she was the weaver of this robe, and she weaved a few of that similar pattern with the bears on the on the, on the back, but that one there is a little bit special. And again, here's a picture of that beaver robe that she's displayed, and you can see even a picture she's weaving it here um, when it's being partially complete. And she was another person who, who it seems that her robes also ended up in Simpsian country. Um, she's been attributed as the weaver of uh, this, this robe here, and she actually wove multiple copies of this robe with its design, and a picture of uh, Charlie Burton wearing this, this robe. And here's an example of another one, where she, and she did weave a number of robes of this pattern, and you see some of these around folks in the community are wearing today. And as an artist, again, she was very accomplished, not just as a Chilcat weaver, but a great skin sewer, basket weaver, moccasin maker, who also sold some of her works to the Alaska Native Arts and Crafts Cooperative. And her records, doc or the records that are there, document that she sold a few, such as in 1951, she sold a robe for $250, another one for 75 and in 52, a large robe for $400. And she was a person who, it appears, seemed to be willing to, to teach young people and to also talk about her work. Um, in some of the catalogs of the Alaska Native Arts and Crafts Cooperative, she was willing to be photographed, she was willing to talk about it, and uh, this is a couple pictures of her in the catalog. And although there's no direct attribution that these robes were woven by her, she did sell some of her robes through them. Um, these may or may not have been done by her. But someone who was willing to teach young people. And next, the last weaver I'm going to mention today, Maggie Cadenejo. Um, she was born in Yakutat and was uh, Luke Nahadi and of the Frog House um, from Dry Bay. She was married quite young as a, as a young woman to a much older Klukwan Kogwantan clan house leader named Mike Kataneha. He was about 40 years older than her, who she remained with until her death. Now there's, at least at this time, I don't have any, I cannot find any information about who her parents were, but it does appear that she came from a, a fairly, I guess you could say a noble family to be married to a Kogwantan clan house leader at the time. And really, you could, her life, the, the more you look and try to study her, she was a person filled with a lot of knowledge. She was trained from a very young age what it meant to be a clique person. 
As far as some of her works, this is a picture here of, of her husband Mike wearing this tunic that she's been attributed as being the weaver of, this brown bear tunic, as well as this blanket here that he posed with um, um, in Clough Wong with. And this, and I should certainly say this tunic is, is fortunately, it's wonderful, it's in the community and being used today. Now she certainly weaved materials that were clan atu and used, um, but she certainly was a very talented artist. And if you look through, uh, Tom Thornton a number of years ago did an ethnographic history of the Klondike National Park in Skagway. Maggie was a, a real key player there in the, in the community and a lot of people remembered her and spoke very kindly of her and talked about her. I've talked about her being an artist, especially in selling her work, and this is a picture of Maggie here selling some of her works. Um, and she would sell a lot of her stuff, dolls, uh, moccasins, you name it to tourists as they pass through. She sold stuff to the Alaska Native Arts Cooperative and even uh, personal collectors. This robe here, which is at uh, the UAF Museum of the North, was commissioned from a collector. A collector approached her and said, hey, will you weave me a, a blanket? This is a smaller sized one, but uh, that, that's what she did. She was willing to do a commission and it took her, took her the time and a collector bought it right from her after she'd done it and held it and now it's at uh, UAF, which I think is great that we can learn about from and see works done by her and her style. And really kind of moving towards some closure here, just ending with Maggie. Um, of course, her husband was much older than her, a good 40 years, and after her death, um, she traveled around a bit for employment um, as a widow. She worked for a time at the Sheldon Jackson School in Sitka. Um, and in the 1939 year, um, the records show that she uh, taught the, what they called Indian Arts and Crafts classes at the school. Um, and a fellow teacher made a little note about her in the sort of school newsletter, the Verstovian. And uh, to quote that bit about her, this uh, teacher wrote that Mrs. Kataneha teaches the girls how to do beadwork and to line and cut moccasins. One of the things the girls enjoy is speaking Clinket. Mrs. Kataneha will have classes on how to tan skins. And uh, she's also mentioned a bit uh, by Leslie Yaw, who was an administrator of the Sheldon Jackson School. And he wrote a history of the school. And he interviewed Florence Dinelli, who was a student there um, at the school. And Florence uh, recalled Maggie and another teacher um, that she interacted with. And to quote uh, Florence, she said, I remember Maggie Cataneha and Mrs. John Newell were hired to teach their clinket basket weaving and Indian crafts. I took spruce root basket weaving from Mrs. Newell, Newell and Maggie Cataneha taught us our Indian designs. Maggie Cataneha lived in Skagway and Haynes. She was noted for her knowledge of clinket art. So Mr. Yaw brought her to Shelby Jackson to teach us. And if you read more from Tom Thornton's book, all the folks that spoke to Tom about the history of Skagway, uh, many people mentioned Maggie. Uh, uh, she was kind of, I guess you could say, beloved. People came to her for knowledge. They, they, young people, she was always willing to teach them, was remembered for giving food to all the little children, um, and had a very kind heart. She never had any children of her own that lived to adulthood. She had one child that she lost in an accident. So she had a kind spot. It was noted as a very kind spot for children. And in closing, looking at the biographies of all these women, um, they've all kind of had a few things in common, that they were community figures of note. They were leaders, teachers, servants. Uh, their knowledge is, uh, and skills as artists not only provided a modest income for their family, but it empowered clans through creations of Apu. Their lives, I think, are the examples of the struggles, yet victories and accomplishments of elders from the past. And 
I think it's a real honor to acknowledge people like these women leaders. Thank you. Questions, I'll take a couple before lunch. If somebody wants to flip on the lights, it's getting dark in here. So uh, thank you. Nathan. Um, I've heard that name, Maggie, but her name was Maggie Kudenaha. It was Kudenaha. Yeah. And I've heard it um, in Haynes. Uh, it was mentioned by a few other people. And uh, that's, that's what I heard. I've kind of heard that, maybe you can help me. I heard that name was her husband's Clinkett name, and it was made into their last name, and that Kataneha was kind of an English way of saying it, and what you said is exactly correct. That <coughs> was the correct way to say the name. Yeah. And, but uh, is that kind of, is that what you feel is correct then? I want to make sure I understand. Yeah. I, I think it's correct uh, because I've heard that that name. Uh, uh, one of the things that um, could you go back and um, you had mentioned Kum Tha. Could you um, where that came up and who who? Who had that name? I'm trying to remember. Way back in the beginning. Okay. Annie Clanny? This moves a little bit slower than I'd want. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Claney. 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 Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, who who has that name? On the top? I'm forgetting. You might get shown up in a, a large list of names. Toward the oh, beginning. one of those names. Beginning. Find that. Yeah, there are a handful of folks that I didn't talk about and don't know as much about, but I did share some of their names. Getting there, thank you for your patience. Well, I must have forgot I'm I'm sorry. Could, I think. could you, uh, excuse me, could you, um, uh, what I'll do is just go over that, uh, maybe when you can be able to find it, uh, could you uh, send it to me? That's my, my wife's name. Oh, okay. And uh, she was given that name uh, during the park lunch. And from the Somewhere you eat. Oh. Sorry. And so uh, she's a weaver as well. Yeah. And Dork is a wonderful person, too. I think Dork is just wonderful. And that's good to know. Thank you. I appreciate it. More questions or comments? I'm glad you um, mentioned Clayton as the name of the name of the Yeah, there's a few pictures of it being used in the community, and uh, it has that blue and black signature, and it's a pretty fair attribution that she made that role. So, concerning Mary Williams, are you in contact with, um, I forget his first name, but his last name is Paul, and he's a relative of one of the, you know, the Paul brothers who were like, lawyers. Ben? Is that his name, Ben? There is a Ben. I had sent him that photo of Mary Williams. Oh, yes. And because he had never seen it before. I don't know how I was in 
contact with him, but I got his email one day and I sent him that photo and he was like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> that photo was taken by William Paul. Oh yeah, I, that's I, right. I think William Paul Jr. Yeah. And so, yeah, I know Ben is kind of the holder of the William Paul Jr. Jr. photograph collection. And uh, that's good to know. I haven't talked with Ben about it. I've, I've kind of thought about it. Yeah, because I, I had that book with that photo. At one time, I was amassing this collection of everything Jill Cat Rose, you know, and yes. then it all burned up in a fire. But I had that photo, yeah. and I sent it to him, and he had never seen it before. Yeah, that's about the only place I've been able to find that that photo shown anywhere. I don't know if the original or where the original is, but it's a good picture of Mary Williams. There's not many there's not very many pictures of a lot of these people. Uh -huh. If they were willing to pose or be photographed, it's kind of a rare thing. So, well, thank you. I just wanted to add, you know, to anything to Dana Hall. That is the name, you know, that my wife, uh, you know, grew up in Dryden, and she knew her. Oh. And um, when she moved to Skagway, you know, my wife used to go and see her all the time. She was just a young girl. Uh -huh. And when it was time for her to take what to eat, my wife would, would, uh, would leave. Uh, she didn't want her to go. She wanted to keep her with her all the time. But, uh, I guess he was too tight to, you know, who was his next cat? She probably loved it then, seeing somebody from yeah, she did. her hometown. And that's what a lot of people said. She loved kids, and she just mm -hmm. feed them, and she bait them in with food. <laughs> Got Steve, and then we'll go with... I just wanted to mention that um, the room, the last one you showed, it had the green print that had the, what you might call the checkerboard pattern. Uh, Faces and it looks like little birds. There's an older version of that uh, purchased by Paul Kane in Victoria in 1847. Ooh. And I believe it's in a museum in Winnipeg. Ooh. And it has a green fringe or just a similar pattern? Green fringe, I don't recall that. But it has, uh, otherwise, it's the same unusual pattern alternating faces and birds. And then it's a slightly different. Um, form line pattern across the bottom. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have the red like that one, but it, it's clearly a version of the, probably, maybe not the same pattern board. But well, that's good to know. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate that. It's possible that the later one was made to replace that one um, within a plan of. You know, okay. I forget the name of the museum in Winnipeg, but it's a big And there's a lot of Paul Keane material, so it should be. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for all the comments. I probably got. Yeah, let's go with the. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that my aunt Margaret's name is Kunuk. And so with that, it's. Uh, thank you for bringing the names and descendants. Or, there are still people that are carrying those names even into this century. Partly that's a, a title I chose, A Cycle of Weavers. I bumped into Clarissa Rizal and she was, we were just chatting and mentioned I was going to talk about these things and start talking about names. And she said, yeah, it's just, just a cycle of weavers. These names are, these weavers are back. These old weavers are here with us today. And so that's why the cycle. Maybe another question that we probably better free everybody for lunch. Honest Lagos, that's the woman out of Catch Can? Uh, yeah, Mary Hunt. Is, you know, oh, is, Mary Hunt is the one that I've heard has been given with that was her clinking name, yes. Uh, I didn't talk about her today. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking there's a robe in Alert Bay by her, but I can't remember right now. Yeah, she, she's a pretty, really interesting weaver who you could say was prolific. She weaved a lot of robes and has a pretty distinct style. You could spot her robes. But yeah, she appears to have lived in southern Clinton country and then married a person and lived um, down in Simpson country. Well, it was Kwakwakiwam. Uh -huh. uh, she married Robert Hunt, who was a HBC, uh -huh. that Hudson Bay guy. Mm -hmm. And they relocated to Port Rupert, mm -hmm. south of uh, Port Hardy then. Mm -hmm. and she lived there uh, out her life in Port Hardy and is said to have woven a blanket for each of her 11 daughters. Uh -huh. And they're so they're scattered all over. Most of them 
some have been located, but not all. Thank you. That's good. I appreciate it. I appreciate the words and and really just to help on making sure I know the names are said right. Thank you, Nathan and, and Bert and, and everyone. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, I probably better set you all free for lunch. Thank you so much for your kindness. And